Good morning. Welcome to our annual student symposium. Um, I'm Ryan Craig. I'm the director of student programs at the Berkeley Center. And our symposium this year features 10 seniors completing their religion, ethics, and world affairs minors. But as you know, we've broken this up into two roundtables. This morning's students, or this morning's roundtable features students who finished their capstones a full year ago, as well as students who are currently enrolled in the capstone. So some students aren't gonna remember what they wrote and the other students are still in the process of writing. <laughs> so that's all to say to have a little bit of grace with this group, they haven't had a chance to really digest um, the projects that are in process, but I'm hoping this provides a great opportunity to give them good feedback so that they can incorporate that into their final capstone projects. Without further ado, because we want to make sure we have as much time as possible for each student, we will start with Sari. Um, if you want to go ahead and get ready, uh, I'll introduce you. She's majoring in international politics with a concentration in international law and the SFS. And in addition to Rewa, she's also earning a minor in Spanish. Her project is on the role of the Catholic Church in the Rwandan genocide and post-genocide reconciliation. So go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Um, so this project really started to interest me because I had learned about the Rwandan genocide previously, but the focus had always been on the failed responsibility of states. Um, but I was more curious about the role of religion in this tragedy specifically. So my research really consisted of analyzing the various reconciliation methods of the Catholic Church, um, examining Catholic apologies and response to those apologies, as well as looking into a secondary sources discussing Rwandan history and the church's position in that history. So when it comes to findings, um, first and foremost, uh, the main finding is that the Catholic Church's role in the genocide is twofold. One, it had a role in, the clergy had a role in organizing and executing the genocide, but there also was a longer role in history of the church in reinforcing divisions within society within the decades preceding the genocide. I think that the transition of the church into a more, uh, a role of reconciliation had a lot to do with one, the political position of the church following the genocide, but two, a lesser explored topic is also um, the fact that there were clergy who were killed in the genocide. So this position of the church as having perpetrators and victims within its ranks, I think also gave it a position of power in the reconciliation process. Now, the second finding I think uh, speaks a lot to the wider implications of religious institutions and this idea that these institutions can assist in reconciliation in ways in which the government may not necessarily be able to. So in this case, for example, uh, the Catholic Church complemented government efforts and offered legitimacy to reconciliation efforts, as odd as that sounds. Um, this had a lot to do with the fact that there was some concerns about the Kachacha courts being run by the Rwandan government um, and the legitimacy of the legitimacy of those courts, specifically with the problem of falsely accused individuals. So the Catholic Church stepped in with their justice and peace commissions and assisted um, with getting acquittals for 730 falsely accused defendants. Um, and the, church, the church's own gachacha courts um, also played a role. They focused on community building as opposed to punitive measures, which is another power um, that the government may not be able to exercise um, in the same way that a religious community or institution can. The transnational abilities of a religious institution, the Catholic Church in situation, oftentimes when we look at the Rwandan genocide, we think of it as more of a domestic issue, um, but it does have regional implications and international implications, specifically with the ways in which conflict from Rwanda has spilled over into neighboring countries such as the DRC. So the church has been instrumental in offering youth trust building exercises and activities between um, youth in the DRC and Rwanda. So given all of those implications and kind of understanding that position, what I'm still researching and looking into is the question of effectiveness. It's obvious that the church has been able to step into a role that the government may not be able to, and it has had a significant impact in certain communal situations, but I'm trying to widen that scope and really look at um, you know, the national implication. It does appear that there has been successful reconciliation widely within Rwanda, but kind of really narrowing in and seeing um, what exactly the church's um, real impact on that would be. So I would love any guidance in regards to how to kind of examine that given that it is a somewhat of a complicated question and difficult to measure. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. And I, uh, I appreciate the, the, uh, the nuances about the church being uh, clergy and, and church members being both victims and uh, perpetrators in the Rwandan exercise because that was my, that was my experience 
can, can you say something about about uh, uh, the um, the role of the, of the bishops in that period, where the, when divisions arose between those on tribal lines, but also between peacemakers and those who were engaged with the government? Can you say anything about that? Yeah, um, I think the position of the bishops uh, immediately following the genocide was a bit complicated because of divisions within the, within the hierarchy of the church. So a majority of um, the bishops and those that were in charge did have a role um, in the genocide to a certain degree as far as being a member of the Hutu community. So that kind of ethic, ethnic um, division did exist. But I think now as we look and see the divisions between those that have been separated into refugee camps and um, have left Rwanda and now those working with the church is where you kind of see a clearer split. Um, more so the people that are currently in Rwanda are now kind of collaborating with the government um, to work with those lines. And I do think there is a still a problem when we talk about sufficiency and in addressing the role of the Catholic church that there are still many clergy members that haven't necessarily um, been held responsible. So you do have bishops that are working in the community and trying to do things, but you have former leaders who haven't necessarily um, been held responsible for their actions. I hope that addresses your question. Sure, thank you. Thanks, Father Hollenbach, would you like to go? Sure, I mean, there's been a lot of pressure uh, on, the, on the Rwandan church uh, since the genocide, uh, coming from several different directions. There's been big pressure on the Catholic community, especially its leaders, in Rwanda coming from the present day Rwandan government. Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda has put huge, I mean, the, the government of Rwanda is very committed to eliminating the influence of ethnicity and ethnic conflict in, in Rwanda to the point where some people say that Paul Kagame is oppressive uh, and denying human rights. He's putting so much pressure on people to move away from any kind of ethnic divisions and so forth. So the church has experienced a lot of pressure from that direction. They put the, they put the Archbishop of Kigali on trial for genocide. That, that uh, trial ended up by dropping the charges because of pressure coming from the Vatican. But anyway, there's been political pressure on the church. There's also been major pressure on the leadership of the church coming from the Vatican. Uh, the Pope over in Rome and various other leaders in the church and outside of Rwanda have put big pressure on Rwanda uh, to make a change. So uh, the other possibility, that's so the transition could have come from that response to outside pressure from government and from larger institutions of the church. The internal change could also, though, come from the recognition of the horror of what happened leading the internal leadership of the church and the people of the church to recognize that they really had done something wrong, that there really was a kind of inner transition or conversion that took place. I'm interested to know what you think those two forces had to do with the move from pre-genocide support for ethnic conflict to post-genocide efforts at reconciliation. Do you think it was primarily a response to external pressure or do you think that there really was an internal change in attitude by leaders and by the people of Rwanda on that level that led to this move toward reconciliation? I'm just wondering how you analyze that. Yeah, I think it was a combination of both factors. Um, I think it's difficult. I, don't, I wouldn't underestimate the, the degree in which international pressure and political pressure because of the church's position immediately following the genocide and how it had kind of fell from power would have impacted its decision to be involved in reconciliation to continue to survive within the Rwandan community. Um, but that being said, um, such a deviation from Catholic doct doctrine and Christian beliefs would naturally spark a certain level of ethical and religious responsibility um, for what has occurred. And I don't underestimate that either. And I do think that's why it's such an important point to highlight the fact that the church consisted of both perpetrators and victims, because experiencing that within your own institution and your own society um, would naturally create a, a reaction, an emotional um, reaction to what occurred. Any, any conclusions you might draw on the role of religious communities in other, con other situations where there's ethnic conflict going on and what religious communities can do 
in advance of a disaster like the genocide in Rwanda to try to prevent these things from happening. I, you, you, we talk about reconciliation after genocide. What about reconciliation that would prevent genocide? Uh, how can the religious communities move in that direction, do you think? Yeah, I think um, one of the main areas through my research so far that's indicated where the Catholic Church might have gone wrong is the ways in which it helped reinforce um, ethnic divisions um, within Rwanda in the years preceding because they were in control of, of education. Um, so I think the way they kind of turned the corner on that is that transnational piece and within a country like the transethnic aspect of it where the unity of the church. So emphasizing this idea that, you know, we are all members of this community, regardless of ethnicity, this or that, we all believe in this. So I think when it comes to religious communities that are in situations where there might be a possibility of genocide or there's ethnic tensions, I think the emphasis on the communal peace that religion offers will always be the best way um, to possibly prevent something like this from happening. Okay, that's good, thank you. Thanks thank you. so much. Um, Catherine, I don't think we're gonna have time to get to your question, but sorry, if you wanna take a look, she has a question for you in the chat and maybe you can follow up with her later or reply on your poster um, to that question. So thank you so much. Um, next up is Lily McGrail. Let me spotlight you. And Lily is a government major in the college with minors in global medieval studies and Rewa. And her paper and her capstone project is on the state of Persian Jews in Iran. Okay, so um, I decided to pursue this topic because I want to explore a topic related to Judaism in the modern world. I became a Rewa minor after taking incredible classes in the JSIF program particularly those taught by Professor Ori Soltis, one of my personal favorites. Um, I chose to study the state of Jews in Iran because I want to understand how Iran's international predicament has affected the life of Persian Jews living within their borders. For my research, I've looked at different journals and books that talk about the state of Jews in Iran, as well as cultural literature from Persian Jews that gives insight in how they feel about their religion and culture and how they are in tension with each other. I also looked at Iran's constitution and their implementation of Sharia to, and how that affects Jews in Iran. Um, my main two questions as I've laid out on my poster are how do Persian Jews understand their relationship with Israel and Zionism? And how does, Israel, how does Iran's oppression of Persian Jews violate Islam's teaching on religious freedom? The methods I've outlined are consistent with what I mentioned um, before on my research tools. My findings have been very interesting. Zionism definitely exists in Jewish communities within Iran, but it is very tampered by the political implications of Zionism. Iranian Jews hold a spiritual connection to Israel, but Iran's Ministry of Education mandates that all children's textbooks in Jewish schools contain anti-Zionist teachings. There's also widespread fear in Jewish communities that anyone could be accused of being a Zionist, which is tantamount to treason in Iran, which the punishment could be state ex execution. So Zionists in Iran have, um, have to live under the radar and there is an element of anti-Zionism among Jews who feel more attached to their Persian identity than their Jewish identity. There has, also, there has been a marked decline in the religious freedom of Persian Jews, especially considering the rights they should be entitled to by the Iranian constitution. Article 13 of the constitution says that Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians must have the freedom to practice their religion in accordance with its history. Members of these three religions are called demi, which is a legal term in Sharia that protects members of religions that predate Islam. Teachings of religious freedom in Islam also gives more leniency to religious groups they call people of the book, AKA Abrahamic religions. But this is, um, this is not how things have played out in reality. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps regularly raids Jewish religious ceremonies and arrests people for violation of standards of Islamic purity like the segregation of genders and modest clothing. They also regularly deny applications for Jewish community members to associate with Jewish organizations abroad, especially Zionist organizations. There have even been allegations that Persian Jews who are um, obliged as Iranian citizens for military service are purposely given more dangerous jobs and put on, as they say, suicide missions. So it is pretty clear that the Persian Jews do not experience nearly the level of religious freedom which is supposed to be accorded to them by the Iranian constitution and Islamic principles of religious freedom. And so those were my main findings. And a lot of it too, um, especially when I was reading 
Bill Pot, which was recommended by Father Hollenbach, and I had to read for our, our Rewa class, was that uh, the oppression of Jews in Iran and the oppression of all religious minorities in Iran is very similar to how even secular regimes oppress religious minorities. And it is not entirely related to Islam, but it has a lot to do with the international situation that Iran finds itself in and having to challenge Israel. Um, and I can take questions now. I'm, uh, you're writing this paper among other things for my course right this semester. So I look forward to reading it uh, not too long from now. But uh, a question I have is um, the Iranian attitude toward Jews how similar to, how similar is it to Iranian government attitude toward non-Shia peoples of other faiths, Christians, Sunni Muslims, and so forth? In other words, are Jews singled out for a spe special form of treatment? If so, is that got something to do with Iranian relations with Israel? Uh, or is it some other cause? So I guess those are the two two issues that I'd have about our how does how does the treatment of of, of, of Persian Jews differ from the treatment of non Shia uh, Muslims you know, non Shia people in in Iran and what's the cause for it? Yes. How would you analyze it? Yes, there is a Iran like is it's a little bit like sort of an equal opportunity oppressor and that it does oppress, you know, every non-Shia Muslim minority religious group. But with that being said, they do single out Persian Jews for particularly bad treatment. And it mostly is related to their relationship with Israel and sort of the feeling of an existential threat that Israel does pose to them. So Persian Jews are regularly arrested for espionage and sort of like these very trumped up charges that don't have any basis just because they are members of the Jewish community. And there has been, so Christians and Zoroastrians have had a little bit, have had it a little bit better, although there now is more of a decline in their religious freedom, which will be interesting to note going forward. The only religious minority that experiences worse treatment than Persian Jews, and I think I'm gonna say it wrong, but the Baha'i, B-A-H-A, I'm saying that right, Dr. Cray? Yeah, okay, so because they are perceived as a heretical offshoot of Islam, so just by being Baha'i, they are heretical, which means that they can be executed just for being Baha'i, which is way worse than any other religious minority does face. But the anti-Zionist rhetoric that does plague Jewish communities, and one of the things that I was looking at too is the graffiti on synagogues in Iran and um, how there very much is this, it's not just the fact that they're Jewish, but it's the fact that they're Jewish and like could be Zionist, could be pro-Western, could be, as they say, like colluding with the kind of enemies abroad, um, more related, like there's a lot of imagery about, you know, uh, the Jewish support for the Shah um, and this and how they feel like just the presence and the Jewish presence in Iran does pose a threat to the Islamic regime. And I believe the current Supreme Leader, it was either the current Supreme Leader or the former president, I'm forgetting which one, but said that kind of alludes to the fact that they're, are, they're looking forward to the sort of mass immigration of Jews out of the country. And hopefully that they want you know, Iran to be a state that like has no Jewish people in it, which is, which is, you know, of course, just a, a just kind of like a major reflection on the attitudes that they have to face in their everyday lives. How do they justify this in light of the uh, Quranic treatments and other normative Sharia treatments about the freedom that is due to Dimi and uh, uh, the the, the uh, other Quranic and uh, Islamic teachings on respect for people of the book. Do they have any any rationale that they can give for why this is a special? Uh, do they give a religious reason for it or do they give a political reason for it? I believe the true reason is very political, but they do have religious arguments for it too. So 
one of the things is that in Friday um, morning prayers, there is often Quranic phrases talking about, you know, Jews being impure and like every, essentially like every non-Muslim being like impure and sullied. And there is, so there is like another sort of part of Sharia that says that essentially Jewish shopkeepers have to put a sign outside of their house or not their house, but their shop, sorry, have to put a sign outside their shop saying that they're Jewish owned and run so that Muslims can choose not to frequent their shops so that they don't get like, they don't, they're not impure by doing that. So, and that does have, it's like origins in Sharia. It's, I'm not sure if it's sort of like the more cultural part of Sharia than the actual deeply religiously rooted part of Sharia. But I think like getting to what, getting to like the original question is that they do use some, like some excerpts from the Quran taken very out of context, which is important to know. But when you're listening to like a Friday morning prayer service, that's not something that's gonna come to mind. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're a little, we're gonna push time on this one, but I wanna give Catherine a chance to ask her question. So Catherine, go ahead. Okay, I'll ask quickly. Um, in every pandemic in history, there's been cases of scapegoating and increases in attacks on minority groups. I'm interested in what situation you're, what are you hearing from what's happening in Iran, particularly the Jewish, but other minority communities? Yeah, so actually one of my articles I read was specifically on this issue of the history of, you know, Jewish scapegoating and um, when it comes to pandemics and disasters. Mm -hmm. And that is very much the case right now in Iran with COVID-19. So there's this massive conspiracy theory that the US, Americans actually manufactured COVID-19 um, to wipe out all of Israel's enemies. Um, so that's like sort of related to, so a lot of, you know, Jewish communities are seen as sort of being in collusion with the um, sort of American government and Israeli government. They're also refusing as of now to use the, Isra the um, Israeli vaccine in Iran. Um, but there has been a lot of scapegoating of, yeah, there definitely has been. And it's sort of tied into, you know, the history of not just, um, the scapegoating of Jews in the past with other pandemics, but also like the blood libel. And there's a lot of that sort of like rhetoric resurfacing um, in Iran and a lot of skepticism. It's seen, and the, it's funny, the author I was reading like sort of flippantly said like, how can every disaster be because of the Jews in Iran? Like how, how is that possible? But that's sort of the narrative they seem to be running with constantly. And it is like a good way for them to politically win a few points, um, you know, take the, take the blame off of themselves as a government. They were of course, one of the worst hit countries in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but yes, there's significant amounts of scapegoating right now in Iran. Thank you. Thanks Lily. Thanks for your questions, David and Catherine as well. We're gonna move to our third presenter, which is Brenda. Romina, I will spotlight you. And Brenda is an SFS senior majoring in international history, and she's going to be sharing with us her project on Our Lady of Charity, an opportunity for agency resistance in the construction of a multicultural Cuban identity. Go ahead. Um, hello, everyone. So as has been mentioned, I'm writing my paper on Our Lady of Charity. Um, I'm Cuban myself, and that's kind of where my interest in this topic kind of began. I wanted to find out who Our Lady of Charity was, why she matters so much to the Cuban people, and ultimately get at her significance. So does anybody really own her story? My middle name is actually De La Caridad, um, and Our Lady of Charity's name in Spanish is La Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre. Um, I also wanted to write a paper that for once my parents could read. Um, so that's kind of where I, that's where I was going with this. So I did this by looking at three different communities. So I wanted to assess the Afro-Cuban community in Cuba, which is closely tied to the Santeria tradition today. I wanted to look at the independence, uh, the independence movement and how that how she was used for on the on the way to independence and the exile and diaspora community. This leads us to the Ermita de la Caridad, which is a church that I grew up going to uh, when I was little. Um, and 
ultimately get again at her significance. So what I found was the blending of African traditions into the worship of Our Lady of Charity. Her significance for the Yoruba people began really as a way of cultural preservation and really an act of agency. Through her, they were able to disguise their worship of Osun, who is the African goddess of fertility, sensuality, divinity. And over time, this became the mixed race goddess of Ochun, who is now associated with Santeria. During the Wars for Independence, she was a powerful tool of mobilization. So the Mambises, who are the freedom fighters, they would sew her image into her into their uniforms. And the man who's considered the father of, of the Cuban nation, Carlos Manuel Céspedes, he made the first Cuban flag out of a canopy surrounding her in the family chapel. She became the Virgin Mambisa at this point, an insurrectionist virgin, the Creole Virgin, and a virgin that was distinctly Cuban. And that really is how she became to, became to be tied to, to nationalism and the Cuban nation. The Mambises later sent a letter to the Vatican asking her to become the patroness of Cuba, and it worked. She was, she became the patroness of Cuba in 1916. And the exiled and diaspora community were thus separated from this figure who had been quite literally almost tied to Cuban grounds. Um, when they came to the United States, when they left the United States, when they fled, when they were exiled, um, they built her a shrine here and they smuggled a replica of Our Lady of Charity to the shrine. And that's the one who, who they venerate there. And the mural that they painted of her it tells a story of Our Lady of Charity mixed in with Cuban history, but it is very much the exile's history. It leaves out parts of Spanish colonialism, U.S. imperialism, and that's been criticized. But I would argue that this is just a continuation of a tradition of using Our Lady of Charity uh, for resilience for the communities that really are, are taking refuge in her. And her significance has survived Castro's repression of religious freedom. And today she continues to be important. Uh, recently, it was her 400 year anniversary of having found her in the Bay of Nipe and hundreds of Cubans gathered in diaspora and on the islands to celebrate. And more recently, Pope Francis visited the, Bas the Basilica where she is and called her, invoked her name as the Virgin Mambisa, uh, the Virgin who you know, helped Cubans for independence. Um, Obama visited Ermita de la Caridad during the same year, which was received, it had mixed reviews. Um, notably, uh, the diaspora is torn on the issue of Cuba. So what do we do for reconciliation? But there's a famous quote that says, Our, the Virgin of Charity unites us. And you know, I would argue that because in charity they see unity, um, charity is a tool for reconciliation and resilience of, of the people. And I can take questions now. That's very interesting, uh, Brenda. I'm looking forward to reading your paper later in uh, not too long from now. Question I have, and I mentioned it in, the, in what I wrote online, about the blending of Yoruba and Santeria traditions with Christian Catholic traditions about the goddess on the one side and Mary on the other side. It's very interesting to me to hear how those things are blended together. From a Christian point of view, Mary has been somewhat controversial in terms of Protestants versus Catholics. Protestants don't really take Mary or think, think that there's an abuse of Mary. But I, I recommended to you looking at Elizabeth Johnson's book on Mary, and I sent you those articles. She interprets Mary in a very liberationist way uh, and a way that would be supportive of the kind of way in which the Cuban people have used uh, the image of the of the Virgin of Charity uh, along the lines. But I'm interested in how you think the blending of these two traditions really is working in the imagery uh, that's portrayed of the uh, of Our Lady of Charity uh, and how that works out. Do you think? Yeah, so Our Lady of Charity is, I think, a remarkable figure in Cuban history because she transcends religious spaces and really inhabits a political space as well. Like I mentioned, she kind of came to be alongside the, you know, alongside Cuba, the Cuban nation. Um, and, and definitely she's been used as a, a tool for liberation in many ways. Um, the way that I see the blending of these traditions is we really get to see it in Santeria today. Um, and Santeria, the way that she's portrayed, uh, she's portrayed as Ochun, who is portrayed in yellow. Um, Our Lady of Charity wears yellow. And while there is definitely that kind of blend, there's also a little bit of tension uh, from both communities. Um, some people in the Catholic tradition who really see Our Lady of Charity as this Catholic um, religious figure, um, well, some, not all, but some within the community see the Santeria aspects as um, they don't like it. They, they don't see it as, as blending well. And some within the Santeria tradition, um, likewise, they see the Catholic traditions as kind of uh, not allowing for a really pure worship that harkens back to that Yoruba tradition. So there's definitely a little bit of tension there. Um, but then there's also, in the broad sense, a seamless uh, blend as well of, of these both of the Catholic and the 
the Yoruba um, past, you know, these traditions. There's also there's also the seamlessness of it. Um, and you go to Admita La Carida today and you see people give her sunflowers, which are significant for both the Catholic tradition and for the Santeria tradition. You see people wear yellow, which is significant for both. And you really see uh, a mutual worship there. And, and you see her as a, as, as a figure for both communities. So there is tension. Um, and with some in each community, but at the same time, there's also a very seamless marrying of, of, of both um, of both practices. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, let's go to Paul. We haven't heard from you yet today. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for that presentation. And the question I have, which I posed in the um, chat yesterday, in a part was addressed in the comment you just made. Just it's about the reality of Our Lady. Um, the way you speak of her and the way your protagonists speak of her as if her reality is unquestioned and it's just what what different communities make of her how as a as an analyst or an historian do you write about um the uh um the significance of a figure wh whose whose very reality is, is so um hard to define what what kind of challenge did that pose to you in the writing yeah, so that's a great question. And I think it's probably the first thing that I encountered when I started writing the paper. And it starts with her origin story. What is her origin story? There's so many variations. I grew up listening to the story where it was two indigenous uh, indigenous men and an enslaved African, and there was a treacherous sea involved and she saved them. And then there's another variation where it's a white man, an indigenous man, an enslaved African. Um, there's another version where the oceans are pretty clear and they find her and they save her, essentially making her the first rafter to be saved. Um, so there's various variations. And this really goes back to what communities are claiming her, what communities are finding refuge in her and seeking that kind of resilience. Um, so when writing about Our Lady of Charity, I think what I, what I did at first was I looked at her origin story and I looked at how that origin story has been used by these different communities to kind of get at uh, some kind of center point. And really that center point is that she is a tool of resilience and reconciliation for the Cuban people. She has become the nation of Cuba and that's how she is understood. She transcends religious spaces. Spaces. She is not just, you know, she is not just a figure for Catholics. She's not just a figure for uh, Santeros. She is really, I mean, she's an emblem of Cuba and that's how she's understood. And that's why it's so significant when political figures uh, like President Obama in the previous administration went to Admita de la Caridad when he was pursuing, um, you know, opening up diplomatic channels with Cuba, because it says something about what political freedom we are aspiring to um, in on the island and diaspora, etc. So. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Father Drew, if you can ask in 30 seconds, you can get squeeze your question in. Sure. Um, Brenda, uh, the, the director of the shrine uh, came here for the anniversary several years ago, and he, he toured the, the, the country. Uh, and I wonder what was the effect of that on American Catholics? And particularly, did it bring about some kind of a synthesis among the different trends of in the tradition of Caridad in the US? So that's a great question. I definitely have not gotten a chance to look at how uh, re most recently American Catholics have been uh, impacted by, you know, by those kinds of events. I was mostly looking at um, the Cuban community and the Cuban diaspora here in Miami. Um, but that's definitely some, that's definitely an interesting thing to consider. And I think I'm definitely going to keep it in mind as I move forward with the paper and try to come at some conclusion towards that in the end. Um, if you have any suggestions, I mean, I'm happy to hear them, but for that question specifically, I, I, haven't, um, I haven't gotten to that part of my research. Great, thank you so much. We have Caroline up next. I will go ahead and spotlight you. Caroline is majoring in international politics with a concentration in international law and minors in Rewa and French. And she's gonna be sharing her project on bodies and churches and political tools. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Craig. So I actually wrote uh, this paper a while back, The Father Drew, so apologies if I forget anything. Uh, but I wrote this paper as a case study on how abortion politics and specifically abortion po political lobbying changes in secular democracies um, that would otherwise have very similar political structures. Uh, the case study I chose to do was 
the United States and South Africa, which may seem like two very different uh, democracies, but they're actually set up incredibly similarly, both in how they were set up, though the timeline is different, the demographics they currently have today, as well as how their legal and judicial system is set up. So in terms of debating uh, the, the subject of abortion and maternal health care in general, uh, the tools are very similar, so it makes for a good case study. Uh, to give some background on the issue, in 2014, the United Nations Population Fund gathered leadership from across different religious traditions for a conference on the intersection of religion and women's health and rights specifically, um, and deemed it necessary that religious groups aid uh, in the improvement of women's health and women's health care rights throughout the world, among other things. Um, so part of what's so fascinating about that is obviously in secular democracies, a lot of the times, uh, religious institutions are often blamed for the hindrance of access to health care, whether it be maternal medicine in general or specifically the access to abortion, whether or not it's legal. Uh, so key sources in looking at this were theological perspectives, legal documents, academics analysis, the history and theology uh, of abortion, specifically in the Catholic Church, and a scholarly framework for the international health care system as it's now developing. Uh, so the research question I was really trying to get at is in the cases of South Africa and the United States, why does the Catholic Church state take such a wide variance in stance in the US pretty famously the Catholic Church is uh, anti abortion in my paper I chose to not use the terms pro choice and pro life just because they have such severe political connotations and emotions attached to them. So if I'm talking about being pro-abortion versus anti-abortion, that's why, just trying to remove the tension uh, in the paper. Uh, and finally, what is this going to mean in, the, in, uh, in impacting the growing international healthcare system? So to give a little bit of background on this, uh, the Catholic Church has not always necessarily been anti-abortion. There are works dating back to uh, Thomas Aquinas specifically, debating whether or not abortion should be legal, um, saying that abortion might as well be legal because there's no soul in the child until the child is born. And obviously as modern medicine progressed and the Catholic Church began to acknowledge it, usually a little bit behind, um, that viewpoint tended to change. So by 1983, after Vatican II, uh, as canon law was codified, the stance on abortion as uh, it currently stands in the Catholic Church is that all cases of abortion uh, if you seek it or if you uh, administer one, results in excommunication with the exception of life-saving measures for the mother. And that's sort of how we are at the climate we see today. In terms of why in the United States we see this sort of taken to the letter of the law quite famously versus in South Africa, we see quite the opposite in which the Catholic Church is actually helping often uh, with maternal medicine similar to what we might see in Planned Parenthood. Uh, that really does not depend on the church itself. It depends on very small political factors relating to how Catholics got into the country. So when it comes to the United States, Catholics obviously have been in this country since it was founded as a minority, but it was a minority that grew very rapidly and grew success very rapidly. As we talk today about the ideas in racial relations about a model minority, you can really look at Catholics in America as the first model minority uh, in an all white, mostly Anglo-Saxon society. Uh, in the course of about 100 years, Catholics went from being seen as sort of uneducated, undesirable, almost unemployable members of the population to obviously producing John F. Kennedy, the first Catholic president. Uh, and so what that produced is sort of this vacuum effect in which there was so much power for the Catholic population in the United States to consume and not a ton being done with it. And so one of the first grassroots movements to come out of this power was the anti-abortion movement. Uh, this had much more to do with what was going on politically in the United States at the time in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, the ebb of the civil rights movement, the ramping up of the feminist, the second wave feminist movement, and most importantly, the countercultural revolution. Uh, and as we've seen going into the early 2000s, the Catholics have actually taken a step back from the mainstream anti-abortion debate, uh, mostly because unfortunately the anti-abortion debate as it's been taken over by stronger evangelical movements has also seen a rise 
in violence and acts of right-wing extremism, which again, we see dovetailing with larger trends in the United States today. Uh, however, on the South African side, the story is very different. Uh, Catholics Car came to South Caroline, I don't want to interrupt you, but we're way over on time. Oh. Can you, yeah. <laughs> so Catholics, just to be brief, came to South Africa as refugees, um, really needed help when they were first there. And as South Africa moved into the apartheid era, Catholics were seen as a really direct counter to the really extreme Calvinist position taken by the apartheid movement. Uh, so as the Catholic Church became one of the famous white allies of the anti-apartheid movement, they ingrained themselves into what's known as African liberation or African revolutionary um, philosophy. And what that entails is inherently a stance that is pro-abortion. So the Catholic Church has been unable to disentangle itself from this. And what we see in this is that what a church is able to do country to country is extremely varied. And to go back to what happened with the United Nations Population Fund, uh, we might not actually have a level of cohesion necessary uh, to be doing sort of maternal medicine on an international level. Thanks so much, Caroline. We'll go, we'll have time for one question. So Catherine, if you wanna offer your question. Um, I think you make um, a, a good case for the politics and the political his, and the broader historical roots of uh, each country's stance. But I'm curious as to what you make about the UN because you make quite a point of focusing on the UNFPA intervention and some of the complexity. So how, what, what link, what conclusions are you drawing from that? So I think the work, and I saw your question on my blog post, thank you so much. Um, I think the UN is moving in the right direction in terms of trying to find cohesions and trends in how to make often difficult subjects palatable globally, which is of course very hard. I worry that there's too much emphasis perhaps placed on religion as the tool to do that when in reality on a secular or on a state by state level religion is often a tool already being used by the state uh, so i worry that the un may not be able to cohesively sort of take over the use of religion at least in the next 10 to 15 years so we'll go to our final presenter for today, Alejandra. Um, I'll get you spotlighted here. And Alejandra is a STIA major, that's Science, Technology, and International Affairs, with dual minors in Jewish civil Civilizations and Rewa. And she's going to be sharing her project on Theologizing Rape, the Islamic State's Sexual Slavery of Yazidi Women. Hi, thank you so much for introducing me. Um, this project first interested me because, like many in this virtual room, I also took classes in the Jewish Civilizations Department, um, many of them with Father Patrick Dubois, who specializes on research about the Yazidi genocide and makes really interesting connections with his studies uh, on the Holocaust as well. Um, and it was always tangentially mentioned in my classes and my readings that ISIS justified their actions by selecting passages from Islam sacred texts. But um, I wanted to explore this alleged justification more in depth because I noticed a gap in my own knowledge and also a gap in the, in the narrative and in the research. Um, so I went about researching mostly by using primary sources. So I used many documents released by ISIS um, as well as Yazidi survivor stories. Um, that I found in either books or news stories, but they're not from my own investigative work. They're really mostly from work of researchers on the ground. So what my findings were, were was that um, ISIS does indeed recruit fighters and then retains them by promising them and then granting them the sexual subjugation of Yazidi women and girls. And if they do so, they justify this rape and slavery by kind of picking and choosing um, very selectively from Islam sacred texts. Um, and then in, in this manner, they condone and they encourage this violent perpetration of power over women. Um, I also found that really ISIS has developed a massive apparatus around this justification um, to make 
you know, organized rape and sexual assault, forced marriage, et cetera, permissible and attractive. Um, for instance, I, the, a lot of my research shows, um, focuses on the publishing of didactic material um, concerning the law, uh, right? Like Islamic law kind of allegedly justifying their violent actions. Um, and I also found that although it obviously has a very big role in recruitment and retainment, it actually also translates and has a big impact on individual victims' stories. Um, like, I mean, I don't want to get like too graphic here, but they there's like a ritual. Um, there, I, I saw a pattern in which there's a ritual around the rape in which religion always plays a part, um, either by like setting the Quran or kind of explaining to the victim how it's justified by Islam. Um, but kind of towards the end of the paper, I posed a, a hypothetical question or really a question for the reader to consider. And I give my own take on it um, because I think they use their faith as a cloak of like purity and righteousness. But I do think that they don't really believe that their actions are justified by Islam. It, they're picking and choosing. It's a very pointed attempt to alleviate their own sense of shame because you do notice, you know, they're publishing didactic, didactic material and, you know, it's on Twitter and Dabiq, which is their magazine, but it's mostly like flaunted. I mean, rape is mostly flaunted in a written form. Um, it's never um, kind of used in propaganda videos or propaganda images graphically, which I think is very telling because you see, you know, like public killings, beheadings, stonings, like horrible images that are flaunted on as propaganda method, but not rape. So I think that's very telling. I think they know very well that um, the rape of Yazidis is really nothing to be proud of and it's not actually justified by Islam. It's just something that they tell themselves. Um, so I'll take your questions now. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions for Alejandra? Father Drew? Hey, Alejandra. Um, I, at the close of your, your, um, your poster and the paper, you, you, you talk about the, the stigma that's attached to both the, uh, uh, the victims and their children. And uh, I guess my question is, has, has there any grassroots on the ground you see the efforts to, to overcome that stigma rather than, than participating in it? Um, there have been efforts to overcome the stigma um, for the women and girls uh, that are returning to the Yazidi communities, um, not really for the children born of rape. Um, there are many organizations, uh, as I mentioned, um, in my poster, like for instance, Yasta, which is one that Nadia Murad is really closely involved with, also Back to Life, which is the organization founded by Father Dubois, who I mentioned. Um, and they, like I said, they focus on kind of healing the trauma of Yazidi women and girls. Like, I mean, many of them were taken when they were like not even teenagers, right? So they're, they're extremely young and they use education and mental health um, to help them um, deal with their trauma. But when it comes to the stigma of children born of rape, it's really complicated because also legally, um, the Yazidis cannot um, keep their children. They have to decide whether they stay um, wherever they are, like in Syria. They might be in Syria, they might be in Turkey. There's different places where they are now. So they can stay with their children or they can leave, join the Yazidi community, but their children must stay legally with the father of I mean, of the rapist or, or the family of, of the father. Um, there have been some very, very rare cases in which they can, for some reason, they, they take their, their children with them, but it is really complicated because then the children are not accepted into the Yazidi community. Uh, so it's like another way in which religion is involved because um, the Yazidis have released a document in which they say, okay, we're gonna accept um, are Yazidi women, even if they were raped and they were converted into Islam, but they have said that they're not going to accept any children born of rape, um, which is really hard because it leaves these children largely placeless. Can I ask a quick question about how 
how, I mean, you mentioned about how the Muslim men who undertake these rapes don't really feel fully justified, but they offer some kind of formal or um, rationale that, that says this is justified in some circumstances. Where does that come from? I mean, what, what's the foundation for a, a justification for rape uh, within Islam, even if the Muslim men who do it don't fully believe it? What, where does it come from? Uh, what, what are the, is it simply because they're outsiders and they don't count as human? Or what exactly justifies this if, if they have a justification of some sort? Yeah, so I, I found there are many different justifications. So they really draw from very different verses in the Quran. Um, but just talking culturally, um, they, for instance, think that they are Yazidis because they're non-believers. They don't have a holy book. So like contrary to, you know, like Christians um, or Jewish people, they they seem according to the Sharia, they're, they qualify for, in, for enslavement. Um, and that according to Islamic law, they can technically be systematically raped. But that again, I am saying like, these are things that are in the Quran and it's it's hard to deal with, you know, when I'm doing research um, because I, I don't want to kind of make blanket assumptions because there are but also- does, 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 does this flow, I mean, does the idea exist in Islam that people who have been enslaved are able to be raped? Is that a sort of automatic following from being enslaved? You can be raped. Is, that's uh, pretty, pretty strong. Yes. Yeah, that, that, that is it. Um, and I mean, there are other many other passages that would contradict this. Right. But the issue here is that ISIS has their own kind of like a fatwa department. They also have their own Islamic scholars and it is them who get to choose which parts of scripture kind of work towards their own, their own bureaucratic and recruitment goals. They pick just particular texts and use them the way they want to. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna put us all back in gallery view so we can say goodbye to one another. Um, Again, thank you so much for joining us for this first roundtable discussion on our Rewa posters. Thank you to all the senior presenters. Congratulations, you have made it through. You can now join the afternoon session in relief that you are done. Um, and to all of our guests, an invitation to rejoin us again at noon um, when we gather for the second round of our five senior Rewa poster presenters. So thank you all very much. See you later.